State and welcome back. In this lesson we're going to be looking at um, the food that we get from the oceans and rivers and streams and asking the question is it a sustainable practice? If not, what can we do to make it a more sustainable practice? So let's dive in. Um, we're looking in the first question it says what caused the growth of the, pop, uh, the popularity of people eating marine fish in particular and if you follow this line you'll see that it flew up pretty quickly uh, in the 1960s and then after that it, around 1990 there's a, a plateau that was reached so part of the thing that caused the popularity in eating seafood primarily um, was human population growth a lot of that population lives near the oceans and there's a, a bit of a boost of um, with education and people saying that this is a healthier protein to eat uh, than things like hamburgers. Um, also technology played a big role in this. You have massive new boats with massive new net technology being able to pull up a lot more fish. Um, so why did it eventually plateau? Well, that's also part of the reason. So much of the ocean was being fished that uh, you can't take it all. And we reached this maximum point now to where we're actually starting to see a lot of fish numbers start to decline. So talking about maximum sustainable yield, first we go back real quick uh, and revisit this idea of sustainable yield, which we talked about when we talk about trees in a forest. It's a very simplistic uh, example because there's a lot of other variables involved. But for the sake of simplicity, here's a forest. And if two new trees grow into this forest, in theory, you could take two new trees out to keep this forest uh, sustainable. The stock in place, two in, two out, two in, and two out. And the numbers of trees stay the same. Um, is this the same? in fishing. Well, with any living thing, usually even, even trees, for example, you'd probably have to plant um, 10, 20, 30 saplings to get them to reach maturity. Other things will take them out. Um, deer, uh, the weather changes, a flood, a drought, a fire. So you need a, a lot more to sustain that. Now, when we're talking about maximum sustainable yield in with fish, we're looking at the numbers, the total numbers that you can take out in a year without affecting that stock of fish uh, and allowing it to replenish, allowing it to, to fight back and grow and, and that, that those numbers, that population size to stay intact. Um, here's a quote from the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. They both featured this title in recent articles, 90% of fish stocks are used Oh, that should be a bit frightening. This is a picture from the Wikipedia page, um, and it's quite a common scene. One thing that's interesting about uh, the maximum sustainable yield, it's not a perfect model. If we do come up with a maximum sustainable yield, say, hey, this is how many of these types of fish you can take a year. Um, there's problems with that because who decides and how do you enforce this globally? Is the data accurate? Do we actually know how many fish are out there? Um, with an El Nino year or with climate change, can we make an accurate prediction for how many fish will continue to be there? If we know this tuna stock is so large, is that going to be continuing anyways, even if we fish it sustainably? Um, so it's not a perfect model, but it's a good model to work with. Um, when we think about overfishing, this is essentially that um, knock-on effect that, that takes place. There's fewer mature fish that the adults are taken out. The breeding population goes down. More fishing boats go out. There's more competition to catch those fish. Prices go up. It's a common economics thing with um, there's a high demand, a low supply. Eventually, there's going to be a crash. Eventually, you just can't sustain this, and which can result in the loss of a species completely. David Attenborough put a, a video out quite recently, and I'll share this in the links. It's very good to watch if. Uh, which ties into this topic of overfishing. And this was made with the intent of sharing with the, the leaders who attend uh, Davos, uh, a conference every four years with political leaders, uh, social leaders out there. And this was trying to convince them to say, stop, stop subsidizing um, deep sea mass fishing practices, industrial fishing practices. 
so a lot of governments are providing money to these practices and, and David Attenborough and the rest of the uh, community who cares about preservation and conservation are saying this is not sustainable, it's a dangerous practice and we're going to see a collapse in world fisheries if we continue this. So what do we do to manage this problem? Some of the issues involved are we can't do one thing and have another group do another, play by a different set of rules. And part of the issue is with fish is they, they move, right? It's not a tree that you're trying to farm on your property with your fence around it. These fish are moving. And, and once you go 200 miles offshore, um, that's fair game out there. So Japan can fish, China can fish, the U.S. can fish in that water. So what's one thing you can put in place? Well, governments can come up to an agreement, which is one thing David Attenborough was trying to push in his video the previous video, saying let's come up with agreements, regulations, quotas, how many can you take a year, what's the size that you can take, um, and have all governments around the world agree on these, these practices. Um, another practice that's very popular now is aquaculture, and that'll be in a slide coming up. The definition for aquaculture is anything that you farm out of water. So it can be seaweed, it can be uh, salmon, uh, it can be alligators in some places in the world. And the last bullet point down here is looking at consumer awareness, educating the public. I bought some salmon the other day and I looked at the label after I cooked it and I looked at the label and I realized it came from a really unsustainable aquaculture practice in Norway. So I won't be buying that again. I didn't know. I had to educate myself and we can all do that. I'll come to this later. This is looking at how do we actually estimate that how many fish are out there in the oceans. And there's one technique, it's called the Lincoln Index. It's part of our syllabus. And it's a way you capture a certain amount, you mark some or you tag some, and then you recapture the next time around and see how many, the percent of those that were tagged. And there's a small formula you can do. I'll just plot that up real quick to give us an estimate of, of a population size. We'll be doing this in class, so I'm going to skip over this right now. If you are interested, you can just hit pause. I'll do a separate video on this as well uh, in the future. On to aquaculture. Uh, like I said, it's not just fish. We tend to see salmon and know about this from people farming salmon, uh, but it includes a lot of different things like in this picture here uh, from a Ted Ed, which is very good. And I'm gonna link that into the description as well. And I really encourage you to watch this because this one summarizes the section of our, our syllabus. So it's a very good video. Uh, really summarizes a couple of the questions that I pulled out from this video, which are these two questions. First question, what aquaculture approaches are we currently using? This is also from our syllabus. Um, well, open is like farmed fish that are in the ocean. Uh, the good thing about that is it's cheap. The problem is but you're dropping a lot of waste out in the concentrated area, adding antibiotics to the fish. A lot of those fish might escape. Uh, and it's imagine like an, a zoo elephant escaping and going back into nature. It's not going to work. Uh, so you get this inbreeding of a weird population back into the wild population, which you can damage, and that's quite dangerous. Well, then you look at semi-closed. What's the plus and the minus of semi-closed? Semi-closed is things like ponds, um, where you have them outside of the natural habitat. Uh, shrimp farms, uh, ponds for fish farming outside of the ocean. And the bad thing about that is it's expensive and it's hard to manage. You really have to manage that environment. But that's also the good thing is that you can manage that environment and control the waste and things coming in and out of it a, a lot more. So pluses and minuses of both of these. And this video will talk about what does sustainable aquaculture look like? Um, could these methods actually make the environment better? Well, actually they can in theory. And actually not in theory, in practice as well. It just takes, takes time and takes a lot of work and management to do this. So in an ideal world, less shrimp farms, less fish farms out there in the wild because they're pretty destructive. And I'll talk about shrimp farms in the next slide and why they're destructive. Uh, but in practice, more shellfish farms and more seaweed farms would actually help to clean up the environment. Shellfish are filter feeders. So they filter out things out of the ocean, microparticles, even pollutants out of the ocean. Do you want to eat those? Um, seaweed farms. Seaweed farms are fantastic because what they're doing is seaweed is a plant and they're green, right? So they're doing photosynthesis, which means they're taking in sunlight and a lot of carbon dioxide. 
we like carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere if we care about trying to shift gears on climate change. Looking at shrimp farms in Thailand, that's provided a huge amount of revenue for the government, a lot of income for local farmers as well. So that's a really nice thing. Um, there's a major problem with shrimp farms as well, is they devastate uh, the local environment, which tends to be uh, mangroves where they're putting these farms. And the statistic I saw online recently was two thirds of the mangroves in Thailand have been destroyed to make shrimp farms, which is insane. Uh, if you think back to the tsunamis that killed a lot of people in Thailand and around the world, um, there were areas where the tsunami was extremely devastating. And a lot of scientists said had the mangroves still been in place in those areas, it would have really reduced the severity of the tsunami. That's a rare event, obviously. Um, but also mangroves are instrumental in, in uh, holding back flooding. And that leads actually to this list of green bullet points here. Why do we want mangroves? Uh, obviously coastal defense from flooding and tsunamis, those things as well. Um, big current topic obviously is the carbon sink. A recent study, and I'll, I'll link it in uh, the description, came out about the fact that mangroves are trapping four times more carbon dioxide as surrounding tropical rainforest. And this was done in the South Pacific, this study. The mangroves also provide a lot of livelihood for people if they want to uh, harvest the wood to build furniture, to build boats, um, their houses, although that has its own issues with using that wood as well. There's also suggestions that the, the leaves have medicinal value, the bark as well, um, as well as uh, a habitat for fish and plus ecotourism has gone up significantly in mangroves, provides a lot of interesting opportunity there. Um, as well as biodiversity. A lot of different plants, animals uh, live and need this area to survive. This leads to the last slide. So if you're part of my class, I'm gonna ask that you do this one. It should take 15, 20 minutes. Um, and it's simply to go out and find an, a sustainable seafood guide. These are printed all over on the internet. Um, I have one, I keep it in my wallet. It's very small, you fold it up. And the trick is to try to find it for your area. So try to find it if we're in Romania, try to find one. If you can't find that, um, try to find one if your parents are from Sweden. They probably have a sustainable seafood guide for Sweden. I know they have one in, in the US and they change in different parts of the US depending on what is available locally. So find that guide, um, simply write a paragraph. What is, what is it and why should we try to use it? That's it. And put that guide into your blog. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.